email that was sent out, and that's my name. So I have a question about that. But yes, I'm, I'm an active member of the community, and glad to be here. Uh, my name is Kay McIntosh. I've lived in this community for over 15 years. I'm from the Black Association, the Federal Black Association, and the Dorsey Outlet. My name is Melvin Hunter. I live on Fillmore Street also. I've been around here since the early 80s. Hi, my name is Wayne Johnson. I live on Fillmore Street. Um, I've been living there all my life, just about. And uh, I've seen lots of changes. And uh, hopefully we'll get this change for us. My name is Cheryl Francis. I'm the uh, co-president of the Federal Street Block Association, and I've lived in this uh, neighborhood for 58 years. Hi everyone, I'm John Pablo. I also live on Federal Street here supporting our Block Association. Uh, I've been in the three years. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Toro uh, from Federal Street Block Association as well. I've been in Brooklyn 16 years. I'm Federal Street 3. Um, here with the Block Association. John Ryder, and I'm just visiting from Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maura Balvin, and I live on Fenimore Street, and I'm here to support the Block Association. Same. I'm Maura's husband, Nick. We've been here about seven years. Same. I'm Karen Joseph. I'm their neighbor. I've been up there on the street for many years. My name is Alicia Boyd. I am a member of the community. I've been doing my best to become a member of this Yule committee uh, for the last two years. I hope maybe this year I won't be a member. And, uh, and I represent MTOP, the movement to protect the future. I'm Dr. Serena Frederick. I am, as of now, the interim chair for Community Board 9. I'm also the vice president of our block, uh, Lifford's Block Association. And I've lived in the community for about 24 years. And um, that's all I need to say now. Thank you. I have this time. I'll turn over the meeting to the new block chair, Michael. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I appreciate it. I'm Michael Lightbird. I'm the chair of the Good Up Committee. I've been living in this community for about 15 years now. And um, thanks to all the returning New York members and the new New York members. Welcome uh, to the committee. Thank you for making it out tonight. So we have a few things to go over this evening. Uh, the first is the Finnemore Street Block Association. Uh, the, the south side of Finnemore, between Bethany and Rogers. They're going to present to the committee tonight and talk about why they like to present an application to city planning uh, to correct their zoning um, because they are outside the boundary of the of the Lefferts Manor uh, historical district. And it's a very compelling presentation. It makes a lot of sense. They need our support. And at the end of the presentation, um, we'll, we'll vote on what they're presenting to us. Okay. Secondly, Ben Edwards, Parkside between Flatbush and Ben, Flatbush, and Bedford? Yeah. Parks and Bedford. Okay. Ben has been trying to present for about a year now. Uh, he's been working on a project. They like that block landmark, and they need the support of the community board to do it. So the first stop is the ULIP committee. If we think it makes sense, we'll make that recommendation to the full board for a vote. Um, then we're going to talk about the latest, uh, uh, the latest of what's happened with the armory, the Bedford Union Armory. Get a quick update there and uh, then we'll adjourn. So a couple items to vote on, a couple items to get updated on, and then we go from there. So first, I'd like to Paul Graziano. Paul's been working with the Fenimore Street Black Association uh, for about a year now, helping them research and come up with solutions to the issues, okay? And they spent a lot of time pulling this together. This presentation is a co-presentation with them, uh, Paul and the association, and they spent their own money uh, to pull this together because there was really no way they could do it on their own. So Paul is an expert in city planning. He has many years of experience. Um, if you'd like, you can go into more detail about his background. 
And at this point, in, in um, the spirit of trying to mend everyone's time, Paul Graziano. Thank you, Paul. Oh. Thank you. So if we could let Paul go through his presentation and write your questions down and take them at the end, that would be much appreciated. Good evening, everyone. Um, just, just a quick correction. I, I don't work for city planning. Uh, I am an urban planner and historic preservation and land use consultant. So I have had my work adopted by city planning. I work almost exclusively for communities that want to protect themselves from overdevelopment. Um, so I, I just as a, as a basic understanding, I've rezoned well over 100,000 properties in Queens over the last decade uh, to help better protect those neighborhoods from being uh, overdeveloped by the wrong zoning. Um, and I've put thousands of buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. I've helped areas get landmarked. I used to be the president of the Historic Districts Council, which is the main grassroots advocacy organization for preservation in the city. Um, and, base, and, and I've also done a lot of enforcement of what are called deed restrictions, which are the private deed restrictions that were placed on properties uh, going back actually about a thousand years uh, under English common law, but really from the 1860s uh, through the 1920s, 1930s was a big period in terms of uh, how neighborhoods developed prior to zoning ever existing. Um, so what happened was, <clears throat> I was actually uh, working with uh, <laughs> actually the Concerned Citizens Group, going back almost two years and consulting with them just on a, on a friendly basis, no money exchanging hands, and uh, kind of describing the kinds of things that need to happen to protect this neighborhood, because knowing Community Board 9 and the challenges that are here um, with out of scale zoning really throughout your entire community board, uh, as well as a lot of new development occurring because of this, uh, it, it was something that I was already on my radar. And back in the summer of last year, I was approached by, uh, summer into fall, I was approached by some folks from the Fenimore Street Block Association. So in a nutshell, uh, what I'm gonna show you tonight, and maybe we can hit the lights, if that's possible. Um, I'm gonna show you basically what we've discovered. And it's, it's very important to understand that this situation is a, a fairly unique situation, at least as far as we know. Um, and it's a good reason to move forward with an action that can uh, remediate a situation that should have frankly never happened. So I'm going to start with that. Everybody, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of in the way of people here. Maybe people want to shift over this way. I'm sort of limited by my cords here. So, let me go here. So, the first question is why should why should Fenimore Block Two, as they call it, or Fenimore Two, which is a block between Bedford and Rogers, be rezoned? Well, the first thing to say is that if you know Lefferts Manor. Lefferts Manor is eight blocks that are zoned R2, which is a single family detached zone. And the reason this occurred was back in the 1950s, there was a big lawsuit that took place. Uh, it's Lefferts Manor versus Fass. And this had to do with a gentleman who wanted to convert one of the houses in Lefferts Manor to a two family home. They took him to court, and it actually created tremendous case law. It's case law that's used not only in New York State, but throughout the country, defining how deed restrictions are enforced. And from the active deed restrictions for Leopard's Manor, and some deed restrictions expire, just, just as an aside, some deed restrictions expire. Some of them are nullified because uh, many old deed restrictions had racist language in it. Many of those were, have been nullified in the 60s and 70s. The Leopards Manor deed restrictions do not have that language, which is why they remain active. Um, these, these restrictions, in many cases, acted as zoning before zoning existed. Zoning didn't exist in New York City 
until 1927. Our modern zoning that we use today came into being in 1961. And in 1961, which was right after this court case occurred, uh, the R2 zone was placed on those eight blocks because of that lawsuit against Mr. Foss, the man who wanted to convert the single family house into a two family house. So what did we find in our investigation? We found that the south side of Fenimore between Bedford and Rogers indeed has the same deed restrictions as Leopard's Manor, identical deed restrictions. And in fact, is part of Leopard's Manor that was essentially orphaned. Um, so that's gonna be the first discussion. Second discussion is, whenever you're looking at a zoning issue, you're looking at compliance rates. When you are doing what's called the contextual rezoning, where you're trying to rezone an area to protect the general scale and, and development pattern of an area. And unlike much of the rest of Leopard's Manor, which again, the reason Leopard's Manor was designated an R2 zone, even though about only about 25% of the area meets that actual criteria in general, is because of this very important lawsuit to make that area so that not only could it be enforced in the court of law, but the zoning would only allow single family homes as well. So this is extremely important. Uh, we feel that we have an argument both from a legal standpoint, but also from a high compliance rate, because this block is actually one of the few blocks that has detached single family homes on it, which is pretty shocking. There's also a super majority of owners support. Um, every single property owner has been reached out to multiple times and almost uh, something like 92% of the property owners signed a document saying that they support this rezoning. Uh, additionally, there are two other properties adjacent to this that we're going to try to rezone as well, which are not in the deed restrictions but are detached single family homes. Um, the other two people who did not sign the document stated verbally that they supported it, but they didn't sign the document. But 17 of 19 property owners did. And again, kind of going back to the original discussion, there's actually a legal obligation by the city of New York to uh, rezone this half block as they did the other eight blocks of Leopard's Manor. As I said, this actually is technically part of Leopard's Manor, even though it is outside of the boundaries of the Leopard's Manor Association, it never was supposed to be left outside of the boundaries. In fact, we have found members on the south side of Fenimore Street in yearbooks of the Leopard's Manor Association going back to the 1930s. So it's very clear that, again, through a, a mistake in history, literally, uh, that something happened here and needs to be fixed. So let's take a look at the south side of Fenimore. So as you see here, this is a, a, a map from the 1873 at Beers Atlas of Long Island, which was one of the first big atlases of every single town and every single village in Long Island, which included Brooklyn and Queens at the time. And you'll see up here the John Lefferts Farm. Already they have platted out the blocks, but there's nothing on it except for a few houses owned by John Lefferts. But you'll notice that there are other estates nearby, and there's this mysterious line right here where my arrow is. Well, that's actually the southern side of the estate. It's the south side of Fenimore Street, not the north side. We go to a map from 1899, and we see, this is right after Lefferts Manor had been established as a development uh, a few years later. Again, a few of the Lefferts houses are here. There's a couple of row houses on Rutland. There's a few uh, barns and garages over here. And all of the development is actually on the frontage of Fenway. You see this greenish line here? That's, again, the farm line of Lefferts Manor. And, and almost every house outside of the, row, the small number of row houses are actually on Fenimore Street, and they're all detached houses. And again, there's your boundary line. Here we are in 1921, the Belcher High Atlas. And again, at this point, most of Leopard's Manor has been built up in that 20-year period. There's your boundary. 
Only a few areas to the north haven't been built out yet. And again, what do we see? Every single building that still exists on the south side of Benamore Street, there are 19 buildings, 17 of them have been built, and they still exist today. And there are two other buildings that were built soon after this, in the late 1920s, which round out the other, uh, the other two houses on the block. I, I threw this in because I wanted to show you that the area to the east of Rogers was also part of the Leopard's farm. But it was developed and flattened out earlier than the main part. And this area also has deep restrictions. They are very similar to the other deep restrictions, but they do not say one family, and they do not say no tenement apartment or flat allowed. But all of the other things, such as a 14-foot setback uh, and other particular restrictions are in this area. So here's the area of Leopard's Manor and the south side of Fenimore. Here's the area that also has other deed restrictions, which includes minimum of two stories, minimum of 14-foot front, front yard setback, and a minimum price at the time, I believe. It, it, it was, you, have, you, couldn't, you, must, you had to spend at least $2,000 to build a home. Now, in 1896, $2,000, when the average house cost about six to $700 to build, a $2,000 house was a very expensive house. So uh, while we giggle about it today, when you look at it in, in the context, it's actually very expensive. So again, looking at Community Board 9, that's the light blue area that we have here. Here's your Leopard's Manor on the south side of Benamore. Here's that additional area to the east. Here are two areas that were also zoned R2 in the 1960s at the same time. And it's my belief that these areas also may carry deed restrictions, although I don't know if anybody's ever done any research on it. I think that there may be other sections that have them as well. But this is, this is just to give you an idea of what's out there in your district. So here's the 19 properties on Fenimore. The, the, the properties that are highlighted in green are the properties that we had as of a month ago, we had found the deed restriction that states single family only. Uh, the other five properties, we did not find that. However, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that if anybody's ever done deed research, it's a real pain. You, the, the, if you look at a, a deed, oftentimes they only go back two owners. Uh, when you hire a deed runner when you're buying a house, that deed runner only goes and looks back to owners. In order to get the information on this, you actually have to go and look at microfilm. And thankfully to my, my helpers in the Fenimore Street Block Association, we were able to locate most of that microfilm. Um, so again, it's not that these don't exist, it's just that we haven't found them. But clearly, oops, these are the deed restrictions. And you can't really read them here, but Here's a typewritten one. More, more likely are the handwritten ones, which are extremely difficult to read. But we managed to find exactly the spots where it stated single family only or no tenements, apartments, and flats, which is the language that are in the Leopards Manor deed restrictions. So this is just the 19 properties to show people what we have. And again, this is, except for a few other spots in Leopards Manor, this is rather unique to this neighborhood. There are only a few areas that actually have detached homes. And this is the full length of them and the church on the corner of Rogers and uh, Fenimore. It does not include the two buildings on Bedford. I, I can get photographs for them. But this is your existing zone in the area. You'll see R2 here for the eight blocks. And most of the rest of your area is zoned R6. Some of it is R7-1. Uh, R6 is a very high density zone. It allows for uh, massive new development. I think you're starting to see some of that in the neighborhood, uh, not only here, but in other parts of Community Board 9. Uh, and what, what folks need to understand is that when the city placed this zoning into being in 1961, the build-out that was anticipated, and what we say about build-out means that every single property were to be developed 
to the zoning as it existed. The build out to that area was going to generate housing for a population of 16 to 20 million people by the year 2000. The problem is, while we are in a historic amount of people in this city, it's only about 500,000 people more than in 1961. We lost over a million people when I was growing up. I'm from Flushing, Queens. When I was growing up, uh, the population had dropped over a million in the city, and it has climbed up about a million and a half. So while we are at a historic number today, it is not that much more than where we were. However, the zoning is for much higher development, and this is creating speculation. And I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, everybody's seen it, um, and to start seeing low-rise neighborhoods sprout six, eight, and 10-story buildings or higher is very jarring, or 23 stories as the one on, on Flatbush. So this is what we're proposing. And again, this is, this is not rocket science. This is not something that we are trying to get through because it's uh, looking at a bigger area. We're looking at a very specific block that should have been done 55 years ago the correct way. And it's really this simple. It's to protect this block from the R6 zoning, which should not be on this block, on this side of the block. If you look at other parts of this block, there are apartment buildings on Worthorn, for example. There are a mix of apartment buildings, detached homes, row houses, etc., which, which, by the way, is fairly common for a large part of this area. It's a mix of housing stocks. There is no mix on this block, and it's frankly a miracle that none of these houses have been torn down in the last 55 years. Yeah. It is really amazing, and it speaks to the, the determination of the people who lived on this block, many of whom have lived on this block for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more. And the, the new folks who've moved in in the last five to 10 years who are buying these homes to protect, not to buy them as a speculative investment and tear it down. So again, we have a, a huge majority of people who would like this, there's the existing zoning. This is what we'd like to see for that lot. And ultimately, this is a discussion for a later time, but the same thing, they like an extension because, as I said, it is actually part of Leopard's Manor, even if it's not part of the organization, it's part of the historic development of Leopard's Manor. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Now, let me. Let me go a little further, which is, we are not asking city planning to do this. We are doing it ourselves. We are doing our own application. That's my job. I'm a professional. This is what I do. So my job is to actually create an application for the Fenimore Street Block Association. And what they are looking to do, and they can tell you themselves, is for Community Board 9 to be the co-applicant for this zoning change. Now, why are they doing this? Um, the administration today is very different than the administration in previous years. I won't go into the politics of it, but I will say this. In the previous administration, uh, there was a willingness by city planning to work with communities, many communities, to help to rezone neighborhoods to better match the existing physical development patterns. Was it perfect? No. Was it better? In many cases, yes. I, I designed many of these as the community person in my part of Queens, where I live, and I did about half of Queens, actually. I also worked in, in Brooklyn and Staten Island. I'm, I'm doing a, a project in Staten Island right now. Manhattan, I consulted there as well, and in the Bronx as well. So, under this administration, all of that has ceased. And we've, we've seen that there is a different agenda, and as I said, I don't think I need to go into any of that with anybody here. But what I can say is that we're not requesting this of city planning. We are putting this in as if we are developers. We are developing for, for the application for this block 
That's the equivalency. Obviously, we're not a developer. We're looking to stop overdevelopment. But we are putting in a ULERP application the way any other individual would put in a ULERP application. What we have found in other parts of the city is that as soon as you do this, the city automatically either A, tries to stop you immediately, or B, tries to work with you. And the way that they have worked with us is when the community boards have been the co-applicants. The community board is an arm of the government. Once the community board signs on as the co-applicant, it is very difficult for them to ignore this. Now, this is not a 197A or a 197C plan. This is us writing the application, doing all the work, and believe me, it's a lot of work to do this. Most importantly, if we came in as an outside group or a developer, what a developer has to do is when they're looking to get a zoning change, is they have to do what's called an environmental impact statement. And they have to pay the city $20,000, $30,000, $50,000 to do this. If Community Board 9 is the co-applicant, the fee is waived. Again, this is not for gain. This is not for profit. This is to help a community organization within Community Board 9 get the zoning that they should have gotten 55 years ago for their block. And with all of the basis of reality. Now, it, the other way that this can go, again, is that the city could actually be sued to do this. I mean, this is the other piece of that. And again, I'm not, that's not a threat for me. I'm just explaining that this is what happened 55 years ago, is that the city was essentially forced to create this R2 zone because of the lawsuit and the decision by the courts. And again, this, this block has the same exact deed restrictions. So obviously, that, that has nothing to do with community board nine. That has to do with this administration, if they were choosing to stonewall. But I believe that if community board nine were the co-applicant on this, it would change the entire discussion, as it did on Staten Island. Staten Island, there, there was roadblocks thrown in front of us. When the, when the community board became the co-applicant, the fee was waived, and the doors were open. I don't know of anybody else who's done this in the city in the last three years, but I, I seem to have found the way that the city can be work. So I'm using that lesson and bringing it here. So I'm hoping that Community Board 9 will sign on to the co and and uh, if they would be willing to uh, make a motion to that effect, the Land Use Committee, as well as any other group that would sign on in the future in terms of the neighborhood organization. Thank you, Paul. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Paul. So for the committee members, uh, to start with, any questions about Excuse the presentation? Excuse me, all the committee members? Yes. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Just to be clear, I want to do a quick roll call so we know who the committee members are. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Frederick? Here. Ben Edwards? Here. Dimitri Lawrence? Francisca Leopold? Pat Baker? Yakov? Here. Fred Baptiste? Present. Real Pia Booms? Matthias Lindberger? Carl Martinez? Here. Warren Burke? Aiden Terry, Pia Raymond, Vinella Perry, Joy Stewart, Lynn Qualls, Here. Nicole, Nic Nicholas, this is Nicholas, Nicola Cox, Here. Esteban, how do you put Esteban? Esteban, 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 Suki, Tom Thomas, and Timothy Thomas. Here. Committee members, any questions? Yes. You're not the greatest for this year. Why not? You weren't black. It's New Year. You're not the greatest year. If the new, new people apply and pick on the committee. When was that process? It took place over the last few weeks. Did you notify the community about that? Yes. Excuse me. Excuse me.
what zone integrity are you looking for? Well, deeds are privately enforced, right? They're privately enforced in a court of law. And deed restriction cases can run $100,000, $200,000. I've been involved in a dozen of them in the last 20 years. It's not that it can't be enforced, it's that it's very expensive and it's a private agreement, right? We are looking to change the zoning to R2 zoning because A, they have the deed restrictions, which is why the rest of the neighborhood was rezoned to R2 in 1961. Because if you look at the rest of Leopards Manor, most of it is row houses, right? So when they look at an area to rezone, to contextually rezone, not to upzone, as we call it, to, to build higher, but to rezone an area where the zoning will better match the neighborhood, they look at floor area ratio. Floor area ratio is the ratio of the, the building. Well, no, I'm, I'm just, floor area ratio, ratio of the building to the, to the property, uh, detached, semi-attached, attached apartment building configuration. They're looking at the width of the lot. They're looking at the occupancy of the property. They're looking at all of these different indices, and they're looking to see what the percentages are. Okay. So part of our argument is, yeah, we should have been done before, and you didn't do it, right? Part of it is that we actually, again, if half this block had been demolished in the last 50 years, it'd be a pretty hard discussion to have. A very tough discussion. This block is intact. It is intact. It's, every single building is detached. Most of them meet the criteria. More than two thirds of them are single family C of O's. And if the properties were deeper, if they were 100 feet deep instead of 85 feet deep, because as you saw on that map, they're a little kind of shorty there, the FARs would be perfect, but they're, they're, they're a little high because of the fact that the properties aren't very deep, because it was the dog leg of the estate, right, when they developed this. Beyond that, the, the numbers are very good. So, you know, again, if you're looking at it from, that's why I said there's a lot of different arguments here. The ownership is a big argument. You've got massive support to do this, right, from the property owners. Number two, it actually meets the basic indices of a land use study, that this actually meets the numbers that they're looking at. Because they're always looking at a certain percentage that, that are going to meet that. You can't take a block of six-story apartment buildings and say, I want to rezone an R1, single-family homes. But if you've got a block of single-family <coughs> homes, mostly, and it's R6, and you want to go to R2, that's a different argument. The third is the deed restriction, which is sort of the baseline of the whole discussion, saying, hey, this is here. Why wasn't this done? So to, to build on Does that answer your question? Yes. To build, to build that question, I want to add to that. Yeah, um, So deed restrictions, do deed restrictions trump the zoning? The way it works yes. is that either a deed restriction or zoning, whichever is more restrictive, trumps. So if you've got a deed restriction that says three family homes are allowed, but the zone only allows one family, then the zone trumps the deed restriction. If you've got a situation where 